Uh, welcome to El Seminario. Today, we're very excited to have Laura Muñoz Baena. Uh, Laura is from Colombia, where she graduated with a degree in biological engineering from the Universidad Nacional. Her master is in biotechnology, also at the Universidad Nacional, focused on the identification of plant viruses in NGS data. Currently, she's pursuing a PhD at Western University in Ontario, Canada, trying to understand how evolution occurs in the overlapping reading frames of viral genomes. Thank you very much, Lara. You can get started. Perfect. Um, so thank you, everyone, for coming to my seminario. Uh, and thank you very much, Claudia, for inviting me. Uh, today, I'm going to talk, as Claudia mentioned, about viruses. But more specifically, I'm going to talk about how viruses evolve their compact genomes. Now, before I talk about viruses, I need to mention, of course, genomes. And every living organism, from plants to insects to mammals, anything that we can think of, have their own information in order to develop and grow. We can think of uh, genomes like books, books where we storage all of the information that we need to, for example, grow hair or to uh, move nutrients across our body or to defend from if uh, defend from infections. However, when we open the books of the that represent the genomes of living organisms, what we see is that there are some molecules like DNA or RNA that store that information instead of words. Now, when we open this book, as I mentioned, what we see is molecules. And these molecules are for the most of living beings DNA, but for viruses, they can also be, be RNA. In this figure here, we're seeing a polymerase, just a protein that it's creating an RNA, RNA molecule from a DNA molecule. And this is not very important for this topic, for this presentation. But what I want you to keep in mind is that these are two very similar uh, molecules because they are made of nucleobases. That's the same compound. And nucleobases are these smaller molecules that uh, can be either adenine, guanine, cytosine, or, or thymine in DNA or uracil in RNA. And what's important is that these uh, molecules bind together, they connect to each other to form chains, chains of nucleotides. So I wish that when I were doing my research, I were looking at these very, co uh, very complex and interesting molecules. Instead, what I look at when I'm doing my research is something like this. So these are basically letters, as you can see, that are either A, T, C, or D. Basically, this is a string of, we are here basically representing a string of nucleotides, and all of these letters represent all of these uh, molecules that are together forming the genome of viruses. Now, I need to talk also about the more, more specific about genes that are some part, portions of the, of the genome that have very specific information. Here, I'm just going to provide an example. This doesn't resemble real life, but I want to illustrate my point. So let's try to pretend that what you're seeing here is an entire genome. Now, some very specific portions of this region are used for the organisms to produce or to extract the information that they need to create proteins. Now, proteins are, for example, antibodies that allow us to defend from infection. So there's a very specific area in this genome that is giving the organism the information about how to produce an antibody. In this genome, we also have a second gene that uh, gives uh, an information about how to create glutamine synthetase that I also, that I honestly just put it because it looks really nice. <laughs> and we have a third gene that is uh, giving information about how to produce hemoglobin, which is very important because it allows us to transport oxygen um, across our entire body. So what I need uh, us to keep in mind is that this is basically that a genome is a string of nucleotides that has some specific portions that are genes, and those genes contain the information about how to create proteins. Now, interestingly enough, viruses also have genomes, and they can be either DNA or RNA, as I mentioned before, but they cannot make copies of their own, so they need to infect hosts. Now, every other organism that is not a virus, so that's like, for example, plants, for example, 
fungi, a fish, amphibia, anything, can make copies of their own genetic material, pass it to further generations, and spread all their genomes in the world. Now, viruses cannot make that, so they need to be able to enter the host, and once they enter the host, they need to recognize a cell, move their genetic material, whatever they, it has to be uh, replicated or where, it, where copies of it can be produced, and then it has to be assembled again uh, in order to be released to the extracellular space and look to infect other cells. Now, the genome of viruses need to be able to have enough protein to make all of these lives or all this infectious cycle possible. So here I'm just going to give an example of the proteins that a virus, a virus that we know very well has. So this is the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so the SARS-CoV-2 genome is an RNA genome that it's inside it, this protector uh, coat. And it is very, very short, only, I mean, not very short, but it's, it's only 32,000 kilobases. Now, uh, this genome uh, is enough for the coronavirus to uh, uh, have information to encode in total 23 different proteins. Uh, in comparison, humans have around 80,000 protein, different proteins. So this is like a very small number of proteins, but those proteins are enough to cause a pandemic. <laughs> but like, as we can uh, imagine, viruses as anything, any other living form in Earth are very diverse. So because viruses can infect all type of organisms, we they come in all sizes and shapes. So we have viruses that are larger and are circular, or maybe some viruses that have this very strange form like bacteriophages. And so if viruses are that, that diverse just on the way they look, you can only imagine how, how diverse their proteins are. Now, this talk is more, specifically, more specific about overlapping reading frames. So for this, I'm going to provide another example that doesn't resemble real life, but just for the purpose of us understanding what they are, let's pretend that this is a genome. And again, this, this genome has one gene. And this gene encodes the RNA polymerase, a very important protein for viruses because it allows us to re, uh, cre create copies of the RNA. Now, this sequence is also being used to produce another protein, that's the spike protein. So the same nucleotide region or these uh, nucleotides here are being used to produce two completely different proteins. And this is what we call overlapping reading frames. Now, you might wonder, why are viruses using overlapping reading frames? What's the point? Well, you, th you have to keep in mind that viruses are very, very small. So if this is, for example, a grain of pollen, then we have here a red blood cell. And very tiny here, we have the coronavirus and then bacteriophages that are even smaller than the coronavirus. So viruses don't have much space. So you can think about it like, if we humans have the entire saga of the Game of Thrones to have the information for us to exist, well, viruses could have maybe a pamphlet. <laughs> so they need to be able to have a lot of information in tiny packages and overlapping reading frames will allow them precisely that. In a, in a smaller genome, they can produce more proteins if they are overlapping. Now, overlapping reading frames will also be helpful for regulation of expression because a mutation that caused uh, problems in the, in the protein sequences will be amplified because two proteins will be affected. Finally, it, it, they, they are also suggested to be used for viruses as a source of the novelty. Now, overlapping reading frames are very common on viruses. Uh, I can give you some, some examples across all Baltimore classes. Uh, what I, uh, I mentioned before that viruses have uh, gen gen genetic material that can be DNA or RNA. So basically the Baltimore classification is a mean for, uh, for us to classify or uh, differentiate, broadly differentiate viruses according to their genetic material. So for example, DNA viruses that have overlapping reading frames is the hepatitis B virus for which around one third of its genome is part of an overlap. In, an, in RNA viruses, we have examples such as 
SARS coronavirus or, or Ebola virus that have some accessory genes that are also involved in overlaps. And for HIV, that is one of the most well-studied genomes in the world, it has around 8% of its genome involving an overlap. So with this, our first question was like, okay, we're seeing this in a lot of, a lot of viruses, but how can we quantify how prevalent overlapping genes actually are in viruses? So in order to do that, we took uh, all reference sequences of viruses in the NCBA, NCBA's database from all, uh, from all type of Baltimore classes, including DNA and RNA. And for each one of those genomes, we quantify the overlapping regions. So what we notice is that when we have longer genomes, that is when we have uh, a larger amount of proteins that are being encoded on that, on that genome, more overlaps are present. So they have a linear relationship between the number of proteins that a, gene pr that a genome produced and the number of overlaps. Interestingly enough, we noticed a different trend when we uh, were evaluating the overlap length, so how long overlaps actually are. And what we noticed is that for longer genomes, such as the genomes of uh, the, some DNA uh, viruses that uh, infect bacteria or some Pandora viruses, they have very, very long genomes, but their overlap ten tend to be actually pretty small. In RNA viruses, on the other hand, RNA viruses are tend to be around like 10,000 nucleotides long, but their overlap tend to range between 10 and 1,000 nucleotides. So they are smaller, smaller viruses or smaller genomes with very, very long overlaps. So with this part of our research, I concluded that around half of our database uh, were viruses that had some type of overlap and that overlapping reading frames tend to be uh, shorter in longer genomes. So with this database, we were wondering, okay, now we have a big picture of the viruses, but can we have, can we find different patterns for specific virus families? So in order to analyze, to analyze overlapping reading frames in a, in a smaller number of viruses, we evaluated, for example, the adenovirus family. This family is house of the human adenovirus that causes mild colds, but this is a very interesting virus because it, it has helped us uh, uh, to develop vaccines. Now we took 71 reference genome, genomes for the adenovirus species, and what we did is to create this type of graphs. So this graph in each circle, you're seeing a set of proteins that are similar to each other. So, uh, and we are relating those proteins uh, according to how they, uh, how they are, are adjacent to each other. So when you see blue arrows, that represents an overlap. So what we noted for the adenovirus family is that we have uh, overlaps that are mainly located on the extremes of the genome. However, this central part of the genome that tends to be like green to blue, so this central part, that part doesn't present many overlaps. But different families have completely different overlapping patterns. So we also have the examples, for example, for the Rhabdoviridae family. This is the house of, of the rabies virus. And here we don't see many overlaps, as you can notice. In contrast with the Geminiviridae family, those are DNA viruses that have these hycosidral capsids that are twins, like are joined to hycosidral capsids. So I think they're very cool. These viruses mainly infect plants. And what we interestingly notice here is that they have a lot of overlaps. Uh, I think it's worth noting, noting that they're also circular genomes and they undergo recombination. So we notice that overlaps are, they have like a very specific type of overlapping pattern. Now the coronavirus, the house of the coronavirus that we know, uh, it doesn't have many overlaps, but it has a, a couple of overlaps on one of, on, uh, of, on one of the ends of the genome that uh, tend to be conserved. And the papillomaviridae family, which is housed of, the, of all human papillomaviruses, uh, they have a lot of uh, overlapping, overlapping reading frames that seem to be conserved across all of these species. But more specifically, we wanted to evaluate, okay, how overlapping genes evolve. And in order for us to 
study evolution, what we do is to uh, measure how sequences change over time. So again, I'm just here providing an example. Uh, let's pretend that this is a gene. This, gene, this uh, piece of the genome in blue is producing this spike protein. Now, if the virus infects a cell and, have, and make copies of this gen genetic material, what's gonna happen is that mutations will occur. So in a point in time, a nucleotide that used to be a C is now a G. Now, those mutations are going to accumulate over time when a viruses keep making more copies of their genetic material. And at some point, this sequence can change so much that the protein now is not dark blue, but light blue. So we have a protein that probably has some different characteristics because it accumulated, accumulated enough mutations over time. Now, the way that we represent the relationship between, uh, between uh, organisms, or in this case, uh, uh, genetic sequences, is by using phylogenies. So this is basically uh, the way that allow us to relate sequences to each other and notice the points in time where they started, where uh, they diverge into different phenotypes. So this sequence here change in three points in time. And this is the phylogeny that will allow us to explain the protein diversity that we are seeing on the present time. Now, mutations on overlapping genes are more interesting because they are not only affecting one protein in purple, but they are affecting two different proteins. So if we have mutations on this side of the genome with, where no gene is being produced, then it won't have any effect on the virus. If we have a mutation here on this only purple region, then only uh, the purple protein could be affected. However, all this region, that is the overlapping region, any mutation here could potentially have an effect on two completely different proteins. So that must, that must be different from evolving a region that doesn't have any genome. Now, our question with this project is, what is the actual effect of overlapping reading frames in the evolution of viruses? So to solve that question, we are starting by uh, making a simulation program. This is just a computational program that allow us to take a nucleotide sequence with overlapping reading frames, and we will use uh, we will use parameters that take into account the overlapping reading frames in order to produce mutations across a along a, phy a phylogeny. So we just draw random times and we start to change the sequence, that is to mutate the sequence. So we create many mutations across the entire phylogeny until we reach the tips of the tree. And at the end, what we have is sequences that are different from each other, but all of which come from the same nucleotide sequence that had overlapping genes. Uh, here I'm just, I would like to show you one of the results that we got with our simulation program. So basically we have the genome of HIV. As I mentioned before, this is a very well studied genome, but it's interesting for us because it has on this envelope region a triple overlap. Now, when I simulated this genome on the simulation pipeline that we develop, what we found is this alignment. So a nucleotide alignment in each column, what you're basically seeing is a position on the genome. So if all the column has the same color, it means that that position didn't change over time. What we, what we are noticing here is for this region that has an overlap, that region is mutating a lot less than the rest of the genome that only has one or no, or no genes on it. Uh, moreover, this specific region that has a triple overlap here didn't seem to mutate a lot, even though the, the, the mutation rate that I put was really, really high. So this region was very conserved, uh, meaning that a lot of mutations are dropping there, and that's creating some um, evolutionary signals that are contrary to what we will expect. So to conclude, I would like to notice what we have learned so far. So now that now we know that overlapping genes are ubiquitous, they are uh, in all type of viruses, but they present substantial variation 
among different Baltimore, Baltimore groups. We also notice that the regions with overlapping reading frames have different mutation patterns and that these mutation patterns lead to the inference of some evolutionary, evolutionary conclusions that tend to be biased by the overlap. Overall, the future direction with this project is we want to be able to develop a method to identify overlapping reading frames just based on the mutation patterns of a genome. Now I am going to abruptly change, change topics, topics because Suminari encourages us to talk a little bit about our home, home countries. Uh, and I have so many things to, to, say, to say about Colombia, but today I wanted to talk about the most important river of our country, that is the Magdalena River. This is a very interesting river because it is born in this area uh, in, a safe, uh, in a very important place for Colombia called El Paramo de las Papas. And it flows are among 21 uh, departments to reach the, the sea, the Caribbean Sea. And this is a very interesting river because it's one of the only rivers in the world that flows from south to north. So for indigenous population, uh, this changed the way that, that they perceive up and down. Now, this river is the, the home for a lot of different species of living organisms. So it's very, very diverse. We have so many, uh, more than 100 mammals, 600 different species of birds, reptiles, and more than 4,000 species of plants. Here, I'm not even mentioning uh, insects that you can imagine with having 4,000 species of plants, many of which are endemic. We also have a huge spe species, uh, a huge number of species uh, of insects uh, that live close and are related to the river. So this river is very important for the history of Colombia. Way before colonization, uh, indigenous populations uh, grow here. They develop their cultures, their, their their science and all their cults, and they uh, shape the way they relate with nature based on their relationship with the river. Later, with the colonization, colonizers also use the river to invade our country by uh, moving throughout the river deep into the heart of Colombia and uh, transporting all kinds of materials uh, by the river. So for me in particular, this river is very important uh, because I've, I've visited many times, in particular here, uh, where I'm showing you Rio Claro, which is uh, uh, a river that, uh, that goes to the, to the Magdalena River. And here we visited uh, La Cueva de los Guacharos. And the Guacharos are uh, some very interesting birds because they are nocturnal. So they, there are no many birds in the world that <laughs> go out at night to feed. They feed on fruits and they make some very strident sounds. So here we are on 2015. I also visited the Tatacoa Desert, which is actually not a desert. It is a tropical dry forest uh, and it's uh, a few hours away from the Magdalena River. And this place was the house of big mammals that uh, lived in, in the Andes, in the Colombian Andes. So being so close, I visited also the Magdalena River, which was a very interesting experience because I was being in maybe the most important river for, our, for my country. So yes, overall, I can tell you that this river, in this river, I have experienced maybe some of the happiest moments of my life. Uh, and if you would like to know more about it, I will highly encourage you to read the Magdalena book uh, written by Wade Davis, and it tells the story of our country by telling the story of the river itself. Uh, this is all for today. Thank you very much for listening, and now I will ha I'm, I'm happy to take questions now.